Good evening, folks. We want to get started and won't be uh, sensitive to your time. I'm Dave Floyd. I'm principal of the junior high, Derek Potter. And uh, we just got a special night uh, ready for you. And he's uh, going to be presenting on some important things that we've been talking about for a long time. Sandy Blank, Blank and I do uh, beer tooth training. And through the beer tooth training, we've had a lot of conversations with parents about the social networking. It's going to come back to that often. And so we we did a presentation last year. Uh, we're doing the presentation again uh, now, and probably one in the fall we'd like to uh, come back to. Um, but I'm going to start us with prayer and, and let uh, let me take off and, and guide us. So let's remember in the holy presence of God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this night, for the opportunity to come together as a community uh, to learn about social networking how it affects us and how it affects our families and our children. We pray that uh, you would teach us the things that you would want us to know and help us to be able to help our children in a proper way. We thank you for the gift of our kids and pray that you would guide us in all that we do. We pray this through Christ. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He uh, has been uh, with Kyra uh, this past year, helping out in various ways. Great, great great help in uh, our technology department. She works at uh, St. Stan's as well in the technology department. She's with the Noah Mentoring. She does a lot of different things, loves camping, families, ball game. We went, you probably see her at every ball game. And uh, I'm going to give it over. So, peace Thank you. Right. Thanks. All right, so I'm first stay with the new microphone. Um, Dave told you a little about myself. Um, most of you know me. My tech background goes back to my first Macintosh computer, which I purchased in 1988. If you're familiar with the early Macs, it was the SE model with the 8-inch black and white screen. And I was proud and happy to wait two minutes for it to save something. <laughs> At that time, I was a graphic artist, and the way that the computer could manipulate and change layouts, particularly of text and font, um, something that might take me three hours to do, it could do in that two minute save. So I was happy to have the tool. So that's where my sorting journey with technology started. So I spent 15 years as a um, graphic artist and eventually found my way into the virtual school of Winona and working with teachers and with education and found that I truly loved it more than anything. So that journey lasted about three years. Um, at that point, I took an opportunity to return to school and got my teaching degree, spent five fabulous years with fourth graders at St. Stan's, and for the last two years, I've kind of come full circle and back into a little bit of a tech education piece, similar to what I did with virtual school. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, I have very simple tech needs. I'm not a complicated tech person. All software must draw. All websites must load in five seconds or less. And no online resource which must aggressively try to sell me something or I will leave immediately. So, pretty simple needs. Um, okay. This is one of my favorite images. It was sent to me by a friend and some images of animals, but it makes the most poignant message of when we go online, who are we? Who do we represent? When our children go online, who are they? Are they forthright? Are they honest? Are they out there as who they really are? And if they are putting themselves out there as who they really are, are they doing this in a safe way? Or are they putting themselves in danger? So, my little friend, do I? When we start tonight, I really wanted to bring in uh, some type of a keynote speaker. In the end, we decided that I would share with you a clip from the TIES conference, which is a technology conference that is in Minneapolis. I attended it in December. And one of the keynote speakers was Mr. Simon Sinek. He is an author. He is a trained, I gotta get this right, ethnographer who is a person who studies people and cultures. One, his book, Start With Why, 
how great leaders inspire everyone to take action, lays out the concept of something called the golden circle. It is biologically what drives human beings to do things. The clip I'm going to share with you focuses on the addictive chemicals that our bodies produce, and this relates to ourselves and our children and our personal devices and why we do become addicted to these things. It's a nonprofit. Um, 
um, they evaluate and they share information about um, websites, about um, softwares, different things that you would want to know as a parent. So they give different rankings. If you look, um, they're recommended eight, well, the age that this is said that is acceptable, they say 13. Kids are saying that 11 year olds should be able to use it. It's rated on a system for quality. Um, it will give you additional information about um, the application itself. In the first paragraph, the one thing that would be good for parents to know, and this is a place that you can go to get this information, and Devin Boland shared this with us last year, is every time Facebook does an update, whatever you may have had for privacy and security settings, never assume that they're okay, that they, they're, they're maintained at the level that you and your child set them at and have agreed upon for security. An update may wipe them out. And many updates, the default is wide open. So always know that with an update, you have to look again to see what your security settings are. The other thing that was in this that I had not heard about is something called frictionless sharing apps, which means that the app can be downloaded and without any kind of warning or forcing the person to interact with it, it is opening you up to GPS tracking. Everything is just in default with total identity and absolutely no security. So you need to be aware of those things. And this particular site gives a lot of information. There is also a section on the site that gives you just a general overview of the intention of the app, the intention of the software, or what it will provide. Um, it's not what users do to it. It's how it is presented by the programmers, users influence in their own unique way. You can see more detail by clicking on that, and you'll get a lot more information on that piece there. Again, this is excellent reading. It's pretty succinct. If you want to know more about this group, they also um, explain their motives, their methods. They have 10 beliefs, which I think partner very well with the parents that we know and, and with what our values are as far as safety and security for our children on the internet. Back at Facebook, the one phenomenon that I had found some information about a while ago was this whole concept of liking something. What I went to uh, Wikipedia, which Wikipedia is created by people, so always approach it with um, caution that people are posting these things. But Wikipedia is an excellent source for primary documents. You can read everything that's written up, but if you go to the bottom, those are the links where the researchers, the um, people who study this, their papers are linked. So you can reach the primary documents through Wikipedia. Be cautious. Wikipedia is everybody sharing what they think. But the concept of liking something, they call it a false consensus effect. What the greatest danger is, is that by liking things, our children are believing that they're giving a valid opinion, that they, if they like it, that means something. They are not being asked to articulate their decision. They're not being asked to support their decision. This concept of liking is becoming, uh, in some ways, it's a little bit of a dangerous thing, is that people feel that there's value in it, and there really is not. Um, the next one that we're going to take a look at is Instagram. It's one of the movies. Instagram is and this is what they describe themselves as, a photo sharing and social networking service. If you'll notice, the photos are formatted in the little square, much like a Polaroid photo of old times, and that was their intent. They designed this to look like those little Polaroids. Um, they're confined to that shape. Instagram is really new. In October of 2010, this Many, many of these things are created by college um, computer majors who are programming just for fun and creating things. This one actually was a group of people intending to create something that would be commercially successful. And so they started in 2010. However, 
they were described as a company with lots of buzz and no business plan. So they had lots of good ideas, but not necessarily a good way to, to follow through. In spite of that, within two months of launching this, they had one million registered users. The thing that floors me on this is how quickly things can go viral, and in our world of connectedness, how quickly something can get out there, and it's beyond belief. Um, 2012, Facebook purchased this. Nice little price there. It was cash in stock worth a billion dollars. And as of February of this year, there were 100 million active users each month, people who were sharing pictures. And Instagram, and you want to share all of your pictures with your family, you can easily do that without having to use a Dropbox or another. It's a very direct sharing method. Um, again, if we go back to Common Sense Media and look to see Instagram, what they have to say about it, um, the kids are loving it. They're saying at age 11, I should be all over this. Parents, not so much. Again, um, any of these things are these instant picture sharing. You have to be cautious and you have to be aware of that the kids very innocently can end up having um, sexual and inappropriate things come popping into their screen because of how things are shared through um, networking. These all access networks like Facebook and they will reach out and depending on how your settings are set, you may not be aware of everything that's being reached. Um, you look at you know, the rankings within it, those are things that you can look at closer. Um, this is um, my dear granddaughter's iPod. She very nicely modeled things for us. And when you're going into settings, I could have given you a handout tonight with all these pictures, but by next week it would have changed. As soon as an app updates, as soon as something new comes out, it changes. So what you have to start looking for and thinking about are general terms and things which you're looking for. Always you're going to want to go in and check privacy. Look at those privacy settings. What is being, what is, how is it being set up? Um, her photos are private, which means only people she specifically shares with is where they're going to go to. She controls those things. You can see in her profile, um, they say that her Email address is going to stay private, but her name is out there and there are other things out there. Um, the GPS, that was something that you have to watch what's being set because some of these programs, these apps, these services, the GPS will identify exactly where that person is at that time. And without even meaning to, they're going to share with hopefully only their friends, but maybe they don't have their settings set right. So their actual physical location can be quickly identified with these. So you have to be aware of privacy settings, location settings. Ask your students, ask your children to show you how they have your, their device set up. They're the ones that know these things. And if they don't know exactly, and it was interesting when I was asking Kirsten about this, there was one of the settings, the GPS settings, that she hadn't really thought about. And I said, absolutely, you turn that one off. You do not want broadcasting globally or locations. Terms of service um, was a long list that nobody ever reads. In 2012, um, Instagram sent out and changed their terms of service and buried in there was the notification that they had the right to sell any photograph that came across their service. And they didn't have to let you know that they were selling your photograph. Fortunately, there were people that read these things thoroughly. Um, became a pretty big issue and it has since been corrected, but beware that the com companies will do that. They will put something into that terms of service and sometimes as painful as reading those things can be, sometimes it's worth a quick look at them. All right, the last one that we'll look at closer is the one called Snapchat. Um, Snapchat is a photo messaging application 
application. It's a simple, quick application. It does work with photos or videos. This is Reg asked me that question, and it does work with videos <coughs> as well. Um, Snapchat, the developers talk about, it's about the moment, a connection between friends, and not just a pretty picture. Okay. That's their goal. So, Stanford University students developed this, it was part of their senior project. When they shared the concept, their classmates thought it was kind of funny. Who wants an impermanent picture, a picture that's going to disappear? And they're thinking, well, you guys are a little weird. But by September of 2011, Mr. Spiegel and his partners launched Snapchat from his father's living room in Los Angeles. And the last that I was checking, it was still housed in his father's living room. Um, within six to seven months, there were 25 images per second being sent. Within another six months, there were 20 million images per day. So it quickly, quickly, quickly grew. Um, there has been, a, as of February, there was a venture capital infusion. Haven't, haven't, I don't know yet for sure if that did move to the delivery room, but it's quite possible. If you go back to our common sense media and look at this one, learning, it was never intended for learning. It's a quick, fun social. Um, kids are saying that you should be 14, which that's pretty cool that the kids are up in, up in the age on this one a little bit, need a little bit more responsibility. Very, very easy to use. You will notice that with sex and the violence are not checked off because again, it has more to, it's the purpose, the development of it, not how it's being used, okay? Um, Snapchat, if you, how many of you are familiar with it? Do your, do your children use it or have you heard of it? Okay, for those of you who have not heard of it, they take a picture, they send it to a friend, and within however many seconds, I think 10 seconds is the max, the picture disappears. Can you put a caption on the picture? Is it just a um, you can add a caption. Mm -hmm. You can add a caption as well. And so the whole concept of it is just having fun in the moment and sharing that fun with your friends. And so, The settings in Snapchat do reflect its simplicity. These are the only settings places. Um, making sure that only friends can send snaps, making sure that those things are selected. Other than that, there's not a lot. Those mobile numbers, um, those are numbers that share for these different apps. The students, it identifies their iPod and, and who they are based on that mobile number. That's how they connect to each other. So these are pretty simple settings, but again, Ask your student to, or child to share them with you. The whole concept is they'll receive it, laugh, and then the snap disappears. Or not. Because if the snap dwells, a simple screenshot with your iPod can capture it permanently on your iPod. If it doesn't, and but the report is that if somebody takes a screenshot, you get a message that says, this is what Snapchat tells you, is you get a message that says, so-and-so captured your, your picture, so you know that somebody caught it. Not so much. Um, it took me five minutes on YouTube to find someone who had a workaround who could completely capture any image for any dwell time, and no message goes back to the sender. Your children need to know that if they push that send button and it goes into cyberspace, it's out there, it's out there forever, and anybody can catch it. It is not true that it disappears. When you say send, you have created a digital image that is on the internet, that's out there. <clears throat> the other place to check settings is the device itself, on an iPod, um, phones, whatever. This is in an iPod, your location services. We gotta check that one. Services are still on. But for Instagram, hers are turned off. Pinger, turned off. 
um, check the privacy settings, check this on the individual. And anytime there's an update of the operating system, be sure to check these things. It's not a guarantee by default they're going to be in a secure position, so you do want to watch for those things. Now what do we do? First, you need to educate yourself. Um, common sense media, talk to other parents, um, talk to teachers, talk to, talk to the kids. <laughs> a lot, and they're happy to share with you. They're happy to teach you. You need to monitor your children. You do have to watch. Um, personally, I would never want my child to have their computer in their bedroom, but now they have these little personal devices, so how do you keep a handle on those things? Um, Snapchat, uh, a good thing is if you see your child in your peripheral vision taking ridiculous pictures of themselves and sharing it, you probably feel pretty good that they're not using this inappropriately and it's really a fun thing that they're sharing with their friends. But if you know they have it, but you never ever see them use it, then you might want to talk to them and have them explain to you their purpose. Because maybe they're being pulled into something that is an inappropriate use of it. Your children will educate you as much as you can educate your children. The greatest education you can give them is the education of expectation, appropriateness, and responsibility, and hold them accountable to that. You also can model for them. Your children see if you are at an event and you are texting and fiddling with your phone. They see this and they know this. So model the appropriate times for using the devices. And as Simon Sinek said, if you're out with your family, you don't need your phone, and nobody does. And you can tell everybody, leave them home, park them on the cupboard, get rid of them, let's go outside, take some time out. There are resources out there. The first one was Common Sense Media. Uh, a key, because I'm a good searcher and I like good resources, is always try to see when that first list comes up, look for the dot .orgs. Those are the nonprofits, those are the academics. They have nothing to sell you. There won't be commercial, you won't be inundated with things that are sold. Their goal is to educate and to help people. So look for those dot orgs. That's always a good place to go. Um, seriously, YouTube is excellent. As much as it has so much other stuff out there, it is an excellent resource for understanding how to do something. And in the case of how to save that Snapchat, even when they said you couldn't, very quickly I came to understand that it's not secure. That it can be saved through some workarounds that our very tech savvy children can do. Um, be an expert searcher with some very simple words. If you got software or an app or something that you don't understand, put in the name, ask for, when you search, a review for parents. That will connect you first and foremost with um, generally academic reviews, sometimes uh, just it's going to be a news review or something, but it's going to give you some information, people who have dug into it and found out what it's about. So use those words. If you're going out to YouTube and you want to know, well, is this true or how can you do that? Include the words how to, what is it you want to do, and then just put in YouTube. And that will prioritize and sort for you those videos that are going to show you how to do what you want to do. So those are some things that can help you. Um, any Googling, Bing, any of your good search engines work with these words. What's next? What are they going to come up with next? How do we keep up with it? How do we know what's going to be out there in the cloud? There are internet footprints that you create every time you go out. And People are, and the businesses are getting smarter. They are, this digital footprint that you leave, they are both passively and actively collecting your data. What websites do you visit? What time do you go there? Who do you email? What are your connections? And they have programmed, and there's that ability to start collecting this data. Um, Google was one of the first ones that got into a lot of trouble with this with privacy issues. I apologize, but I didn't really research how that was in the, in the end result. But I think the biggest thing for our children or for ourselves to remember is that when we're on the internet, we leave a footprint. And it's one that 
anybody can access when they know how to obtain that information. So with our children, be sure that they know. If you hit that send button, it's out there. If you post it on Facebook, you might say, well, my Facebook's private. It's just for me and my friends. If you put anything on the internet, it is not private. And never will be. You have to believe that. Our children have to believe that. If you're willing to share it, put it out there. This last quote, and I searched quite a while for a quote to finish things up with. Um, ended up finding that that was really great, but I was thinking, well, Einstein really said that. And I'm always double-checking things. I have to have three resources that give me the same information off the internet before I believe it. And so my second resource told me, no, this is, wasn't true. Um, our technology has exceeded our humanity. It's a powerful statement. It actually is traced more accurately back to the 1995 movie Powder, talking about how technology is becoming more important. The picture itself is the one that is the most compelling in that when you walk through school, when you walk around and you see groups of people who should be interacting, but who are all plugged in. We're in a tough place right now. It's, it's still new, it's still wild. The pendulum is swinging. Let's hope it swings back. Um, good things that I've heard and read is that Facebook people are becoming more selective. They're unfriending people who post things that are inappropriate. It doesn't matter quantity, it matters quality of friends. So those things are coming to the place that they should be. But as soon as something becomes old, the next new thing is out there. It's not gonna slow down. It's not gonna get easier. But if we work with our kids every day and keep that communication line open and the expectation that it's going to be open, they'll be okay. <laughs>